Good morning, brothers and sisters, and happy Sabbath. As we return to our studies, and we consider the words from the pen of inspiration, shall we thank our Heavenly Father for this time that we have to come to understand his instruction and direction better, for us to understand that which is set before us, and for that which needs to change within our lives, within our characters, so that this message may be given to the world around us. Shall we now ask his guidance in prayer? <clears throat> Gracious Father in heaven, we come before you on this day of rest. We thank you for the many blessings that you have been providing through this week. Father, there have been many challenges. There have been many things that have been put before us where we need to learn more to praise you. For as we are told in scripture, we are to praise you in all things. Thank you for this time that we may spend together. Help us that we may lift up our eyes, that we may be guided in the path that you would have us to follow. Help us now, direct us. May we be edified by this spiritual food. May we be spiritually strengthened. May we be spiritually, morally, and mentally prepared for that which you would have that would come before us. Join with us now. May your angels attend us. We need you. We need to be guided by you. We need to accept that which God, you are putting before us. Please forgive us of our sins. Help us to grow to becoming the men and the women that you would have us to be for this time in earth's history. For this, we thank you. For this, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Last week, we began our study in Zechariah chapter 3. Now, there's a couple of things that I'd like us to consider as we get into this chapter. What is highlighted before you states that God will work for his people if they will yield their lives to him. So if God is not working for us, what has occurred? Well, what hasn't occurred is we haven't yielded our lives to him. Right. In years past, I always came to understand this as being an if-then statement. If God's people will yield their lives to him, then God will work for them. I think that this, this is a very direct restatement of what Mrs. White has stated. Now, as I prepared for this study, I was led to look at some other items. Now, these are not yet totally complete. 
but they will be completed and then will be sent along. Almost a year ago, there were some manuscripts that we began to address. And almost every one of these manuscripts has more than one typed copy of the document with Ellen White handwritten interlineations. These handwritten interlineations have not been released by the White Estate. Now, as I went through these documents before, there were some additional items that were brought to mind, which we are going to share at the beginning of this presentation. Now, many times you're going to find that, that these specific areas were highlighted in making them bold or underlined. I'm not gonna read all of them, but we are going to go through this step by step. Let those who have named the name of Christ cease their criticism and bind up with one another and with Christ. Let them cherish feelings of tenderness and love and not think it a virtue to differ. Where there is union, there is strength. So again, if there is union, there is strength. If we are not willing to be unified with one another, then we will find that the strength that our Heavenly Father is offering dissipates and is not available to us. When God's people work together harmoniously and intelligently, Christ's request to the Father for them will be fulfilled. What request are we talking about? We find it in John 17, verses 22 to 26. The glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one. And that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold thy glory, which thou hast given me. For thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. We have a choice. If we choose to work together harmoniously and intelligently, then this request of Christ for us will be fulfilled. The Lord sees that for the spiritual health of the human agent and for the future well-being of his cause, all self-confidence must be cut away. If we are believing strictly in ourselves, we are not then truly serving Christ. When men and women become sensible to their own weaknesses, their own deficiencies, they will then delight to do God's will. When the heavenly anointing comes to us, we shall learn the lesson of meekness and lowliness, which always brings rest to the soul. He 
if we choose to learn the lesson of meekness and loneliness, if we then choose to learn what true rest is about, then the heavenly anointing will come. God brings all into trying positions to see if they will trust in a power out of and above themselves. He often has to break up human connections and change the order which man has mapped out which is perfect in man's estimation. Are we to rely upon man or are we to rely upon God? Tests are placed all along the way from heaven, from earth to heaven, excuse me. Unless this was so, the road to heaven would not be called the narrow way. Character must be tested, else there would be many spurious Christians who would keep up a fair semblance of religion until their inclination, their desire to have their own way, their pride and ambition was crossed. When, by the Lord's permission, sharp trials come to them, their lack of genuine religion of the meekness and lowliness of Christ shows them to be in need of the work of the Holy Spirit. Let us not endure the thought of being religious dwarfs. This point was driven home for me this last week. Our reliance cannot be upon man. Our reliance is to be upon Christ. We are to receive his counsel. We are to have the faith that works by love and purifies the soul. We need an enlarged faith. The Lord desires his will to be done in the hearts of all who believe in him. But many who might be laborers together with God will never be because they cling to their imperfections of character. Are we doing this today, brothers and sisters? Are we clinging to our imperfections of character There are sinners in Zion who need to repent of sins that have been cherished as precious treasures. Until these sins are seen and thrust from the soul, until every faulty, unlovely trait of character is transformed by the Spirit's influence, God cannot manifest himself in power. There is more hope for the open sinner than the professedly righteous who are not pure, not holy, and not undefiled. This is a comment that can shake a person up if they choose to accept it. Yeah. You know, so just um, so when we look at at these types of things that she's talking about, I mean. She's contrasting this with the open sinners. So these are like the Pharisees, you know, they're whited sepulchers, right? right. Um, and so this is the thing that's difficult for us to look at in our own lives because we can have all kinds of religion. You know, we can, we can be orthodox in our thinking. You know, we can have the correct view of the daily uh, we can believe in 9-11 and November 9th and July 18th and all of these things we can study, we can 
be faithful attendees to the various uh, Zoom meetings, whatever it is we think that uh, can make us feel that we're okay. But there is a deception that's that, and, and the thing I think about here is these sins that have been cherished as precious treasures. So these would be um, things that we wouldn't necessarily in our own minds think as sins, right? Right. So these aren't, you know, the, the sins that we normally think of as sins, but these would be attitudes uh, towards others, attitudes about ourselves, about, you know, uh, things that, that we use to cover up our defects of character. Um, so, you know, we could be proud about the fact that we have the correct view of the daily, for instance, or that we know certain things, or that we believe the 2520. But these are really sins. And, and the thing is, we can think that these are precious treasures. Uh, and especially when they cause division between uh, others. So it makes us think that we're better than others. Now, of course, this could also be things like conspiracy theories as well. I mean, they can be other things, other beliefs, but they're just not open sin. They're not things that we would, we ourselves would define as sin. Uh, would you agree with that? Yeah. Okay. The spiritual anointing of the Lord will never come to self-sufficient men and women. What does this tell us about the, dis the upper room experience that the disciples had? Were they self-sufficient? Well, they definitely were before the upper room experience. Right. And, you know, July 18th was supposed to um, work in us this type of repentance, this recognition of what was in our characters. Um, now, not that I'm a judge of other people, but I would say based upon the condition of the movement, this hasn't happened you know, the upper room experience has not yet occurred. So that means we must still be self-sufficient. So if we are yet self-sufficient, we are going to need, as she would state here, until the soul is emptied of self and the Holy Spirit takes possession, you will be unready for the coming of Christ. And, and if we weren't self-sufficient, we wouldn't have the reaction to messages such as this that I have seen where somebody is presenting a message and a mocking sort of retort would be something like, well, who do, do they think they are? Do they think they're better than us? And you know, if we ever find ourselves thinking those thoughts, we better be aware of where those thoughts come from. Agreed. So let's restate this as we have restated a few others. If the soul is emptied of self and the Holy Spirit takes possession, then we would be ready for the coming of Christ. Now, there are those that would have us believe that Christ is going to return. He's going to accept everybody. They don't have to be prepared. They don't have to give up their sins. Christ is just going to remove these because he loves us so much. Yet here we have the statement, until the soul is emptied of self and the Holy Spirit takes possession, you will be unready for the coming of Christ. What does it tell you 
when the next sentence states it further. You will certainly be weighed in the golden scales of the heavenly sanctuary and be found wanting. What passage of scripture does this call to mind? Well, it, it um, there are different scriptures, but I mean, I think a little bit, it reminds me of uh, Revelation chapter two and three, just dealing messages with the seven churches, but also specifically, I guess, uh, Daniel chapter five. Agreed. That's what I had in mind. Do we want to find ourselves at the point where a hand has written on the wall upon us or in any other manner, meeny, meeny, tekel, you farson? If we are found way and wanting, are we saved? No, we would not be. Who is willing to lay his finger upon his cherished idols of sin and allow Christ to purify the temple by casting out the buyers and sellers? Who is prepared to allow Jesus to enter the soul and cleanse it from everything that tarnishes or corrupts? God calls upon men and women to empty their hearts of self. Then his spirit can find unobstructed entrance. <clears throat> Stop trying to do the work yourself. Ask God to work in and through you until the words of the apostle become yours. I live, yet not I but Christ liveth in me. And of course, there's no symbolism at all within Galatians 2.20. Does this not call us into reunion with God and with Christ? Just as soon as the men in positions of trust realize their inability to do God's work and submit to God's wisdom, the Lord can work with them. He will supply all of our necessities if we will empty the soul of self. Again, if we will empty the soul of self, then he will supply all of our necessities. Now, the question is, um, so the soul needs to be emptied of self. And we know um, that there is a deception that we have regarding ourselves, that we think of ourselves as better than we really are. Now, what are the, what are the indications that we can have that self is, is um, not dead, not crucified? To whom are we giving glory? Okay, that would be one. But what about, you know, a dead man doesn't feel pain or that he's not hurt. You know, when we're hurt by others, wouldn't that mean that self is alive? Yes. Yeah. When God works, give his name the glory. Do not receive praise from men. We have looked, we have seen many times where glory that should be given to God is given to men and is accepted of men. Are we to lift up man or are we to uplift the risen Savior. That is one of the questions that we need to come to every 
day. When a man is filled with the Holy Spirit, the more severely he is tested and tried, the more clearly he proves that he is a true representative of Christ in word, in spirit, and in action. If we are to be represented, representing Christ in word, spirit, and action, are we then not living out the three angels' messages? Are we seeking for his fullness, ever reaching higher and higher, trying to attain to the perfection of his character? When God's servants reach this point, where we are trying to attain the perfection of his character, they will be sealed in their foreheads. The recording angel will declare, it is done. And of course, again, no symbolism in Ezekiel 9-11. They will be complete in him, in him capitalized, whose they are by creation and redemption. When we see this, when we accept this, when we are seeking to try to attain the perfection of his character, then the ceiling is going to come. These are the tests that are coming before us. When we possess this religion, we shall show sound spiritual growth because we are partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. There are no idlers in the Lord's vineyard. We must be laborers together, else we shall fail in the work of overcoming, and our religious influence will cause other souls to fail. No soul is lost that does not draw other souls down with it. Let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from all iniquity, that Christ may not be ashamed of us. Are we going to lift others up or are we going to draw others down? In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I appeal to church members to arise and closely criticize themselves. Feel that this work is so important that you cannot engage in criticizing others. That's hard. But it's something <clears throat> we need to accept. The forces of the powers of darkness are mustering for the closing work of this earth's history. Oh, how earnest should we be to examine ourselves. How do we examine ourselves? Are we to compare our lives with that of other men around us? You know, we compare ourselves with Christ. How do we compare ourselves with Christ? Well, through God's word, through the law. What experience do we have where we are comparing ourselves with Christ? Well, through, our, through our trials. Were you talking about the Mara vision? 
I'm speaking of the Mara vision, yes. But that comes through the study of God's word. I'm not disagreeing, and I'm not saying that it doesn't. Yeah, because, I mean, you're not going to just, you know, just have it for no reason. I mean, there is a... We look into the perfect law of liberty. Right. We are in positive danger of losing our souls when we are criticizing others, remarking others' failures. We must examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith, prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. 2 Corinthians 13.5 There have been many that are willing to criticize when questions are being asked. There are many that have been willing to criticize when understanding is sought because we don't want to see those that are in error dragging other souls down with them. Now we should think of our state before God, how carefully should we seek to obtain a knowledge of ourselves from the word of God. Is this not exactly what was just said? We need this knowledge. Our comparison of where we are today from the word of God. The erring ones who have had their sins laid open before them, many of them, not all, thank God, will feel that they are misjudged. They will vindicate their own course, justifying themselves, and we be, become alienated from those who, in the fear of God, tried to do the very work that the Lord has given them to do, namely to reprove, to rebuke, and to exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. The reproved ones who do not humble their hearts before God will not confess their sins, which are not all specified, but will cover them up and make light of their errors and grievous transgressions, which have been a stumbling block to saints and sinners and have corrupted souls. The very thing that gained for Satan the sympathy of one third of the angels in heaven was this spirit of self-justification. Satan has kept up this work ever since his fall, and he has large numbers of men and women who follow in the very steps he has taken until they fall from the truth, give up their steadfastness, and stand on Satan's side as accusers, criticizing others, while they seem to think that their own ways are hidden from the Lord. That, the God, that God doth not know, and that he doth not take knowledge of their ways or of their crooked works. Let us not be part of this. There are many who try to correct the lives of others by attacking what they regard as wrong habits. They go to those whom they think in error and point out their defects, but do not seek to direct the mind to true principles. Such a course often comes far short of securing the desired results. When we make it evident that we are trying to correct others, we too often arouse their combativeness and do more harm than good. And there is danger to the reprover also. He takes upon himself to correct others, is likely to cultivate a habit of fault finding, and soon his whole interest will be in picking flaws and finding defects. Do 
do not catch hold of isolated ideas and make them a test, criticizing others whose practice may not agree with your opinion, but study the subject broadly and deeply and seek to bring your own ideas and practices into harmony with the principles of Christian temperance. There is something better to talk about than the faults and the weaknesses of others. Uh, so just to go back to what she's talking here about um, Christian temperance. So it is true there is a correct way of eating, right? But sometimes we, we uh, take, well, she says, hold, take hold of isolated ideas. Right. So I think she would be talking about, uh, you know, certain ideas of health, right? So there may be some counsel that Ellen White gives us regarding to some point of, of diet. And some people will make that as a test. Um, and even though they may be correct, what she says is that we need to understand and study the subject broadly and deeply and bring our own practices in harmony with the principles of Christian temperance. So, I mean, not, and I'm not trying to judge others, but I've seen many who will focus upon some aspect of health, but be neglecting all other aspects of health. And in their approach, it's judgmental towards others. Now, the danger there is one is it, it doesn't help other people, but it also can uh, make us exalt ourselves to think because we've passed this test, whatever it is uh, that we believe, you know, how we should eat or how we should live in some way, then we think we've passed the test. And so we, we just find fault with others when it, it draws away our attention from our true need. Right. Because the laws of health, as she talks about here in these statements, I mean, these are something that are given for our benefit. They're not. Um, so she says here in this last paragraph, which you, you just read the first line, instead of looking upon an observance of the laws of health as a matter of self-sacrifice and denial, they will regard it as it really is an inestimable blessing. Right. And so these are not meant to be things to criticize and pick at others, uh, but these are something that are to be a blessing to us and they need to be presented in that way. Right. Not as do's and don'ts. And right. then if you, you know, if you don't eat this way, then somehow you have failed. And since I eat that way or I do this thing, that I'm somehow better than you. That's what we think in our own minds. You know, and, I, and I've seen this in this movement. And, and Jeff, with, this is one of the problems that he had with um, health as it's been presented by many who, who have come to him uh, to try to present the health message. It's done in this way. And, and, it, and it's such a shame because the health message is such a blessing to Adventism. But rarely is it presented in the correct way. When I, when I was at Silver Hills in British Columbia, Phil Brewer was excellent at presenting uh, the health message. And, um, and one of the things that I find a principle that he used, which I used raising my kids, instead of looking at everything as do's and don'ts, it's providing something better uh, to people and, and then experiencing it. Right. So you, you have the health guests, they would come and, and, you know, he didn't lecture them about the things that they were doing wrong. He, he just showed them how to do right and how much better they would feel. And so this is just a blessing given to us. It's not meant to be a test to see who's, who's following God or who isn't following God so that we can judge one another and especially not so that we can exalt self. Agreed. Any other thoughts there?
Many refuse to be illuminated by the light which irradiates others. They grovel in the darkness, criticizing everything and working themselves up to a state of great excitement. They excuse themselves because, as they think, they have a just cause for their complaints. But if mistakes have been made, as we know they have, we are not to talk of them and bemoan them. And behold it, by beholding them become changed into the same image, then live ever under the shadow. God has made us the depositories of his truth that we may teach others also. Truth will triumph. The end is near. The heralds of the cross, whose duty it is to warn men to flee from the wrath to come, have solemn, difficult work to do, and this earnest work must be done. They cannot afford to stand questioning and criticizing others. The enemy of all righteousness will work with surprising power through an accusing spirit to sow the seeds of discord and of variance. If the workers are a unit, they will have to die to self and hide in Jesus. They will not in the slightest degree disparage the work of one another, even though to their view, some things appear unattainable. You may create an unreal world in your own mind and picture an ideal church where the temptations of Satan no longer prompt to evil, but perfection exists only in your imagination. This world is a fallen world, and the church is a place represented by a field in which grow tares and wheat. They are to grow together until the harvest. It is not our place to uproot the tares, according to human wisdom, lest under the suggestions of Satan, the wheat may be rooted up under the supposition that it is tares. The wisdom that is from above will come to him who is meek and lowly in heart, and that wisdom will not lead him to destroy, but to build up the people of God. Whenever we are criticizing, whenever we are trying to strike down someone else, are we building up the people of God? God has entrusted to you a capacity for knowing him and the power of his grace. Through, though the grace of Christ, you may overcome your evil hereditary and cultivated tendencies and may no longer be an accuser of your brethren. Every day in which you employ your powers of speech in criticizing others, you are pleasing the enemy and doing his decided service. There are those that will not like to hear that statement. Yet, should they have problem with it, I suggest they take it up with the author. We are in this world as probationers on test and trial. God has furnished us help in order that we may improve our time and powers and become in spirit and word and character like Christ. If we attain unto this standard, our names will be written in the book of life as members of the royal family, as sons of God, heirs of heaven. Christ will look upon the overcomer with pleasure and say, I have redeemed him. I have covered him with a robe of righteousness. He will walk with me in white, for he is worthy. <clears throat> there has been much strife of tongues, such neglect of the work that ought to be done, that much, very much, has been lost. In the place of making centers of influence for the Lord's work, 
men spend their time criticizing and condemning what others are doing. They think that they must make others walk in straight paths when they themselves are constantly making crooked paths for their feet by their unchristian course, strengthening the spirit of strife and dissension. The Lord looks upon such ones with great displeasure. Unless they put on the robe of Christ's righteousness, they will be rejected by God. Do we wish to find ourselves on the side where we are rejected of God? Let them study carefully the parable of the man who came to the wedding supper, not having on the garment provided for the guests. Let them remember that while they are watching and criticizing others, they are neglecting to put on the robe of Christ's righteousness. So again, if we are watching and criticizing others, then we are neglecting to put on the robe of Christ's righteousness. This next statement was quite telling. They have neglected to look at themselves in the divine mirror. Again, we are given a very interesting reference to the Mara vision. Now, I know I've you know talked about this before, but uh, we know that in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, that um, Paul gives a really good illustration of what this is. Right. And... Um, so he contrasts uh, the ministration of death and the ministration of the spirit, right? So the ministration of death is the law written and engraven in stones that when that was glorious so that when the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. And then he talks about the ministration of the spirit. It's rather glorious. And then he shows what this is. Um, so it says in verse 15 of 2 Corinthians chapter 3, but even unto this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, and, and the question is, what does the it refer to? The veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Now, the it there refers to Israel, right, in the context of, of this. Um, so this, this um, Mara, Mara vision is is meant to be uh, something that is given to God's people at the end of the world so that they can see their sins. So, so it is a message. Right. Right. It's not just, see, the thing is, I think some people have in their minds uh, that, you know, somehow we have a revelation of Jesus Christ. It's just we're walking down the street one day and, and Christ appears to us or we're praying in our closet and Christ appears to us. But really, this is a message. And, and so people keep looking for it in the wrong place because if they looked for it in the right place, they wouldn't like, to, they wouldn't like where it comes from. Or what they see. Well, what they see, but it's it's just that it comes from an unexpected place. The truth doesn't come to us to flatter us. It comes to us to humble us. And so it always comes from the most humblest of servants. 
It comes from a place that's least expected. Um, I remember in, in Warburg Church, one of the elders was doing a sermon and talking about this and how, you know, there's going to be a message coming to our church and it's going to come from the least expected place from, from somebody that we don't want to hear from. You know, for, for the very reason that it, it goes against our pride and our sense of self. Correct. Hmm. When pride when self are being stirred up, we get to see in ourselves just how little influence Christ has really had within us. <laughs> Therefore, we have neglected to look at ourselves in the divine mirror. Those who give themselves to the work of spreading evil reports have no desire to put on the garment of Christ's righteousness. Can she say this any more directly? They claim to have a knowledge of the truth. But the truth does not work in their lives with sanctifying power. They may seat themselves at the Lord's table, but they have not clothed themselves with the garment of righteousness provided for them, and they are dismissed from the heavenly banquet. God's people are to show an appreciation for one another, esteeming others as better than themselves. That whole paragraph is very pointed. If you would have an entrance to the holy city, you must surrender your own hearts to God to be purged, cleansed, refined, and purified. Are we to be purged of sin? Are we to learn the ways of righteousness are we then to be judged tried in the fire are we then to come out purified unless thorough conversion shall take place in the hearts of our people they will view things incorrectly and will be led to work at cross purposes with God. The Lord calls for a thorough work in all spiritual lines. Saith the Lord, I have not found thy works perfect before me. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon you. God calls for thorough and decided reform in all who profess to believe in him. This is the work that is presented to me, must be done in our churches. Ministers and people would now do well to do thorough work and cease criticizing others and repeating discouraging reports, which weaken the hands of those who will do their appointed work. If their brethren will not block their way, let the work begin now and be carried forward until the change for which God calls is effected. In answer to the questions of a brother who is perplexed by the inconsistencies of others, I repeat the words written in the past. When Christ left the world, he gave to his disciples the work of carrying the gospel. The professed followers of Christ are held responsible for the warning of the world. How are we doing this solemn work connected to us, committed to us? We must come before the world speaking the words of God, that the world may know that God has sent us and that heaven's mold is upon the work. 
we must search our hearts and see if we are right in the sight of God. We each have a work to do for ourselves. And while we are criticizing others, we are neglecting the most important work of all. Do not keep your mind fixed on the defective example of professing Christians. You will, of course, see in their lives things that are not right. But if you keep looking at their faults, you will become like them. If you keep looking at the faults of others, then you will become like them. Instead of looking at the lives of your fellow men, look to Jesus. There you will see no imperfection, but perfection, righteousness, goodness, mercy, and truth. Take the Savior as your example in all things. In looking to men instead of beholding Christ, you have made a great mistake. Now here, she closed this document, quoting Zechariah 3, 1 to 10. Was Zechariah being criticized in this passage? And if so, who was criticizing him? And he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that has chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee. And I will clothe thee with a change of raiment. And I said, Let them set a fair mitre upon his head. So they set a fair mitre upon his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord stood by. And the angel of the Lord protested unto Joshua, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, If thou wilt walk in my ways, if thou wilt keep my charge, then thou shalt also judge my house, and shalt also keep my courts, and I will give thee places to walk among these that stand by. Now we're going to be getting further and further into this. We've just begun Zechariah 3. We need to keep in mind, it is not our position to criticize others. It is not our position to be pointing fingers. It is not our position to do the work of the adversary. A choice is being presented before us. Are we willing to stand under the blood-stained banner of Prince Emmanuel, or are we going to stand under the banner, the black banner of the great apostate? Again, God will work for his people if they will yield their lives to him. You are not working for men merely to receive wages. An eternal reward will be given to him who faithfully labors for God. At half past two, I spoke to a goodly number of people from the words of Zechariah. And he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. The Lord led my mind into a channel unexpected to myself. 
but from the testimonies born after the meeting, I think it was just what the people needed. And the Lord said unto Satan, the Lord rebuked thee, O Satan, even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuked thee. Is not this a brand plucked of the fire? While Jesus is pleading for the subjects of his grace, Satan accuses them before God as transgressors. Where does this criticizing, accusing attitude begin? It begins with the great apostate. The great deceiver has sought to lead them into skepticism, to cause them to lose confidence in God, to separate from his love, and to break his law. Now he points to their defective characters, to their unlikeness of Christ, which has dishonored their Redeemer, to all the sins which he has tempted them to commit, and because of these he claims them as his subjects. Jesus does not excuse their sins, but shows their penitence and faith, claiming for them forgiveness. He lifts his wounded hands before the Father and the holy angels, saying, I know them by name. I have graven them on the palms of my hands. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, and a broken and contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Psalm 5117. And to the accuser of his people he declares, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Christ will place his own signet upon his faithful ones, that he may present them to his Father, a glorious church, not having one spot, or wrinkle, or any such thing. Ephesians 5.27 Their names stand enrolled in the book of life, and concerning them it is written, They shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Those who are owned and approved of God are not therefore recognized and honored by the world. The very names that are taken upon the lips of Jesus as belonging to his sons, his own sons and daughters, joint heirs with the King of Glory, honored among the heavenly angels, are often those that are spoken with contempt and mockery by the ungodly. Steadfast souls, who Jesus delights to honor, are for his sake defamed, imprisoned, mobbed, hunted, and slain. God's people must live by faith. They must look over into the great beyond and choose divine honors and the recompense of the reward above every earthly gain or preferment. While probation continues, they must expect that the world will know them not because it knew him not. <clears throat> Satan is wide awake while men sleep. He sows his tares. In completing the work of rebellion, Satan is represented as a roaring lion going about seeking whom he may devour. Those who are self-sufficient, who do not feel the necessity of constant prayer and watchfulness, will be ensnared. Through living faith and earnest prayer, the sentinels of God must become partakers of the divine nature, or they will be found professedly working for God, but in reality giving their service to the prince of darkness. Because their eyes are not anointed with the heavenly eye salve, their understanding will be blinded and they will be ignorant of the wonderfully specious devices of the enemy. Their vision will be perverted 
through their dependence on human wisdom, which is foolishness in the sight of God. What do we recall here regarding the vision? What should we see here? Are we not given an admonition to the church of Laodicea that we need the heavenly eye sound? Is our vision perverted by the heavenly eye sound? Or is it perverted through our dependence upon human wisdom? Well, the thing about the ISAF, because you got um, gold tried in the fire, white raiment, uh, ISAF, let me see. I just get a, how is it worded? Um, Right. Uh, so you got uh, gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich. And we know that, of course, that would be the, the trial of our faith, the trials we go through, the refining fire. Um, and then this white raiment, which, of course, we see in the story of uh, Joshua and the, a and, uh, and the angel. Right. So we got Joshua, who's in filthy garments, he's going to be clothed. Um, and that's so that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes, eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. Now, when I study this out in the spirit of prophecy, um, the eye salve is uh, here because people are not anointed with the heavenly eye salve, as she says. Their understanding will be blinded and they will be ignorant of the wonderful a uh, specious, specious, however you say that word, specious. specious devices of the enemy, right? And so what, what we have is, is we need to be able to see the devices of the enemy, right? Which is what she's been talking about. And the devices of the enemy are trusting in our own view of things, how we see others and how we see ourselves without God, you know, justifying our own selves. And so I always think of the, the speck and, and the log and the beam, right? So if we have this heavenly eye salve, we will be able to see our own defects of character because that's the problem with Laodicean. It's this blindness, a blindness to their own defects of character. And so that's what we need. We need to be able to see our true selves. And there's all these different illustrations in scripture. You know, there's uh, the mirror, looking at the mirror. What do, how do we see ourselves when we look in the mirror, right? And we looked at it in um, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Now, James talks about it too. And he says, uh, he that is a hearer of the word, not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass or a mirror. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. And just like Paul, he refers to this law of liberty. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed, right? So even though some people look at Paul and James in conflict, uh, they're looking at the same point because when, when Paul talks about it, um, he says, now the Lord is that spirit and where the spirit of the Lord, there is liberty. And we all with open face beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. So this is the ISAP. This is the thing that helps us to see our true condition. And all of these come from Christ. Right? This gold, this is the righteousness of Christ. This white raiment is the righteousness of Christ. And this ISAP 
is the spiritual discernment that comes from Christ. It comes from seeing Christ, from by beholding him. That's why we can be changed into the same image from glory to glory. But I think sometimes, you know, we take these statements and we just kind of, well, we need this, this, this gold tried in the fire. We need this white raiment. We need this ISAF. But we don't really have any practical way in, in to, to relate them. That is, they're just words and they need to become a part of our experience. We need the entire experience, don't we? If we are not willing to put on the robe of Christ's righteousness, from what we have just read, are we representing Christ? If we are not willing to accept the gold tried in the fire, how can we then present Christ? If our vision is perverted and we are choosing to depend upon human wisdom, and I mean human wisdom, whether we're talking to a doctor, human wisdom, whether we're talking to a minister, or whether we are just using human wisdom in our studies of scripture have we then accepted the heavenly eyesight <clears throat> in a vision given in 1880 i asked where is the security for the people of god in these days of peril the answer was jesus maketh intercession for his people and satan standeth at his right hand to resist him and the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that has chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. It is, is not this a brand pl plucked out of the fire? As man's intercessor and advocate, Jesus will lead all who are willing to lead, to be led, saying, Follow me upward, step by step, where the cause, where the clear light of the Son of Righteousness is shining. Again and again since 1845, the dangers of the people of God have been laid open before me. And I have been shown the perils that would thicken about the remnant in the last days of time. So here in 1890, she's writing that she has been shown repeatedly since 1845, these dangers that the people of God had before them. These perils have been revealed to me down to the present time. And on the night of November 3rd, there was laid out before me some things that I could not comprehend. But the assurance was given me that the Lord would not allow his people to be enshrouded in the fogs of worldly skepticism and infidelity. But if they would follow his voice, rendering obedience to his commandments, he would lead them above the mist of skepticism and unbelief and place their feet upon the solid rock where they might breathe the atmosphere of security and triumph. No soul is saved except as he is found, standing on the elevated platform close beside our advocate and surety, where light shines from the throne of God, illuminating the pathway and preventing the wily foe from stealing a march upon the servants of Christ. The only hope of a perishing world is found in the union that can be formed between humanity and divinity. Humanity is perfect only as it is united with divinity. Can we be perfect in and of ourselves? Is 
if humanity is united with divinity, then humanity can become perfect. But instead of following the divine plan, instead of taking advantage of the heavenly vision, men have sought out many inventions in harmony with Satan's devices, for he is the instigator of these vain imaginations. If men would cease to trust in man, cease to put confidence in their own devices, and in simplicity of faith, trust in the Lord God of Israel, they would come out of the cave of the darkness of human reasoning and stand in Jesus Christ, where they could hear the voice of God and know the voice of the true shepherd. Are we today, as a movement, following the divine plan? In a greater scale, is the church today following the divine plan? Is the church taking advantage of the heavenly vision? We need greater reliance upon Christ. We need to cease to trust in the word of man. Now, <clears throat> before we come further into this in the book of Zechariah, what other thoughts or comments do we have for this day? There's been a lot that we have just addressed, much of which has been very hard to hear. At no time have I sought to point a finger. But in all ways, I look to that which needs to be corrected within myself. What I have learned is that we cannot trust in the wisdom of man. I have learned that I cannot have confidence in my own devices, in my own thoughts, in my own decisions. In all things, I am to rely upon Christ. In all ways, I am to exercise the simplicity of faith, trusting in him and trusting in the Father to do what is most necessary to walk in the path that, he, that they would set before us. Do we have any other thoughts then for today? Any other considerations? All right. Shall we then close with prayer? Loving Father in heaven. We need your wisdom. We need your strength. We need your assistance so that we may set aside our reliance upon your creation so that we may be more willing to have total reliance upon you as our creator and Lord. Direct us today. Show us that which we need to do. 
help us so that all that is done may bring glory to you and that we may rest knowing that you are in full control. Be with those that were unable to join with us today. Help us so that what is done may bring more glory to your character and your name. For this we thank you and for this we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.